I'm just waiting for my translator. But, uh, I'm told that everyone on, over here near the capital is very highly educated and fluent in Australian, so we should be good to go. Should be good to go. Um, the text today is, um, and thank you for your kind words, Gabe. I didn't, uh, it, was, it was a real joy to work with Gabe. Um, you're blessed to have this guy as a pastor. He's the real deal. And he's not even paying me to say that. I mean that. Um, um, it was a great joy to work with Gabe. He was a big loss to us, and Gabe had an incredibly diverse uh, skill set, so you're the beneficiaries of that. And uh, we miss him, but we're glad that he is out here ministering, and it's encouraging to see just a healthy congregation and him ministering the word along with the rest of the team here. Our text today is um, Exodus 34, verses 5 to 8. Very motivated to do a good job today. I want to honor God in the preaching of his word. And I'm also informed that the NSA is probably spying on me at the moment. And um, I want to do a good job. So people at the NSA, you need to hear this today. Listen extra careful today when you're spying. Exodus 34, verses 5 to 8. Um, and it's talking about um, when Moses was hidden in the cleft of the rock and God appeared to him to give a re revelation of himself. Verse 5, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him, Moses that is, as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Moses made haste to bow low toward the earth and worship. So for my outline for today's passage is pretty straightforward. My outline is that God declares, God defines, and God demonstrates who He is. God declares who He is, God defines who He is, and God demonstrates who He is. These four verses are God's disclosure of Himself to Moses on Mount Sinai. But we need to go back a bit to understand the gross sin that precipitated this staggering encounter between God and Moses. So at the end of um, Exodus 31, Moses comes down from Mount Sinai uh, with the Ten Commandments. You could say Ten Commandments 1.0, right? Because he had to do it again. Um, but what he saw was absolutely shocking to him as he saw them dancing around that golden cow. And I'll never forget, it was absolutely shop shocking to me the first time I read through the Bible as a newly converted believer. You've got to understand, you know, I don't come from a Christian home. And when God saved me uh, while I was in the military in Australia, um, I became convicted to read the Bible and I just started reading through it. And, I, and imagine reading it and you don't know what's coming next. You know, I thought, well, I'll start at the beginning and go to the finish. It's long. I'll try and get through it. Um, but I was that naive kind of kid. When I grew up, you know, I actually had thoughts in the morning when the cartoons were going to come on, we had a lot of cartoons, we'd watch as kids, and I always wondered, maybe today is the day, you know, that the roadrunner catches the coyote. <laughs> or, sorry, rather, coyote catches the roadrunner. Maybe today's the day. I actually had those thoughts that maybe today could be the day that the coyote finally gets him. And I watched to see, is this the one? Is this the one? I think there were people who used to watch Gilligan's Island to find out if this is the one where they finally get off the island. But... When I read through, it was the same with Israel and their dealings with God. You know, I thought, surely, okay, God is just so good to them, and now they've, they're coming out of Egypt, He's brought them out of Egypt, He's been faithful to His Word, He keeps providing miracles to feed them, He's doing everything for them, and they keep moaning and complaining and rebelling. 
And when Moses got the Ten Commandments and he received them, I thought, man, okay, this is the time they're going to do what they're told. I'm sure of it. I'm reading this thinking, this is the time they're going to do what they're told. And he comes down and they're dancing around this golden cow and I just couldn't believe it. It just was an ongoing, relentless thing. I didn't understand the point of our sinfulness and our need that, that, that the hero of the story is God. <laughs> and we are sinful and He is faithful. And it magnifies His glory, the fact that He redeems sinful people, that He is patient with sinful people, that He is long-suffering with us. That is good news. But what did Moses find when he returned? As I said, he found them dancing around an idol of their own invention, the golden calf. Let's just take a quick look, just go back a little bit from where we were, Exodus 32, verses 23 to 24, to read how Moses' brother Aaron, the first priest, explained the golden calf. For they said to me, make a God for us who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt... We do not know what has become of him. I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them tear it off. So they gave it to me and I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. Other than that, I can't tell you anything. You know, those of us who have kids, we know these stories, don't we? There's this viral video right now about these two kids who are covered in paint. The father's talking to them. I don't know if you've seen it, but yeah, what happened? Well, oh, well I don't know. <laughs> You know, I, I can't, it just, I was just hearing this happen. I mean, I was just minding my own business. Aaron's like that, you know, I just said, well, they gave me the gold, I threw the gold in the fire and the cow came out. And that's how it is. So we, and he blames the others, you know, well, the people, they gave it to me. You know, we've just seen this, this is the tendency. We've even seen that with the current president talking about Afghanistan and saying that, well, there's all these other problems, it, 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 blaming pretty much everyone but himself and that is the human tendency. But I, I want to ask an interesting question from this story of the golden calf. I think it's a, it's a great sailor to just pause and just ponder this for a moment. So I think it's a huge thought. And that is, why is there a second commandment? Okay? There's ten commandments. The first one, you shall worship the Lord your God alone. You can't worship any other gods. Right? And the second commandment is, you shall have no idols. Right? The question is, is the second commandment redundant? You know what I mean? Is, is it like only, is it a, just a, merely a restatement of the first commandment in the negative sense? What do you think? Is there a reason, what, what would, can you think of a reason why there might be a second commandment? And this pertains to this incident, incident right here with the golden calf. And that is that you can make an idol out of the one true God. So it wasn't just other gods, because when you see Aaron announce the golden calf, he says, when Aaron unveiled the calf, it was described, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. That's how God describes himself throughout the Torah, throughout the Pentateuch, over and over, the God who brought you out of Egypt. And so Aaron says, you wonder what he's like, this is what he's like. Right? Probably based on some cow god. The Egyptians had a lot of cow gods. He probably saw them and got that idea. But the second commandment is a prohibition against making the living God, the God who fills the heavens and the earth, into some 3D man-made image or representation. That's a repudiation of Roman Catholicism, quite frankly, where they have their images of God and Christ on the cross. It's saying, it, it, he's saying, you shall worship the Lord your God alone and you shall not have any idols of other gods or of the living God. He is a speaking God. Now, we will see him in our glorified bodies, but until then, he speaks to us. As we'll see, it's not safe to actually be close to God's glory. Just because we don't have the ability to melt metal doesn't make us immune from the same error of idolatry, does it? The God who affirms gay marriage is a modern golden calf with all sorts of professing believers dancing around it. 
we commit Aaron's and Israel's sin every time we begin a sentence with, to me, God is like this. We've heard that before, haven't we? To me, God is like that. Well, it doesn't matter what he's like to you. What is he like? He defines truth. And that's why I wanted to talk about this passage today, because we live in a time of lies. Just lies. People lie. We've got fake news. We've got false narratives. We've got different versions of reality. We don't know what to believe. But God has revealed himself. He has said how he is. And it is ironclad truth. You can take it to the bank. And in a world full of lies, we need concrete truth. And we are the repositories of truth in our neighborhoods and where we work and among our families. It's one of the things I look forward to about heaven now more than ever, is the fact that it will be a place of truth. There will be no fake news. (laughs) And there is no fake news here. This is true. So we might not have the ability to make a little idol, fashion an idol, but we do have idolatry and we have wrong ideas and our own version of God. And this is rampant today, isn't it? Um, It's what we see in John 6, when the crowd's following Jesus demand food to feed their belly. You know, he returns after the Samaritan woman. They've found out about his miracle of turning the water into wine. And they say, well, if you're really the Messiah, then perform a miracle for us so that we might believe. And here's a hint. (laughs) Moses, you know, had the manna come down. You can feed us. You know, they want their bellies filled. And that's their meet my conditions of godness, right? Right? meet my conditions you know we need to be very careful when talking to atheists and they say if there really is a god show me the proof give me the evidence question for you on the day of judgment what do you what do you call the in 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 australia in england they call it the dock when you're in trial the judge and the judge holds the gavel and you're in the dock what do they call the dock in america what do they call it The witness stand, right? So on the day of judgment, who's going to be in the witness stand and who's going to be holding the gavel? Right? God is. And when we, when we bow to atheists and try to appease them with some evidence that we think might persuade them, we're actually turning the tables and putting them in the judgment seat. We need to be very careful not to do that. We're doing them a disservice because on the day of judgment, it's not going to be like that. We don't have to provide evidence. Now, we can give them answers. I'm not saying we don't. I'm not saying there isn't evidence, but we need to be very careful about what we're doing when we do this because God is the one who defines himself. God is the one who reveals himself. God is always the one who sets the terms. Remember at the cross, the people gathered around the cross. If you are the Christ, then come down. Because according to me, if you were God, you'd do that, right? Right? Because I want a God on my terms. I want to set the, the parameters for what qualifies as God. And newsflash, when you're doing that, you're actually making yourself God. It's an, the most probably obscene form of idolatry, making yourself God. You know, I'm reminded of a public discussion. Um, I think this happened while I was at seminary, at Master's Seminary. Um, some of you might have heard of Michael Horton. Some of you heard of Michael Horton. He wrote a great book called Christless Christianity. A Calvinist, uh, professor or lecturer at uh, Westminster Seminary on the uh, West Coast, and the Arminian Roger Olson. Roger Olson, we, we had to read a textbook by Roger Olson in seminary. If you go to Master's Seminary now, you do not have to read that textbook anymore because I complained relentlessly about that book. I hate that book, and I moaned and moaned, and it's no longer there. So if you go to seminary, I do want the credit for knowing that you don't have to read that book, (laughs) because I moaned so much to Nate Busnitz that he dropped it from the curriculum. But Roger Olson was just a flaming Arminian, and um, the point here isn't whether he is an Arminian or a Calvinist, but in the debate, Olson said during the debate, he said to Michael Horton, If I found out that the God of Calvinism is true, I could never worship that God. Just just cold fear just engulfed my body when he said that. I said, I can't believe you said that. Like you were saying that I will only worship on my terms. 
That's, um, that's some of the most terrifying words I've heard from a professing believer. You know, Calvin was right when he said that man's nature is a perpetual idol factory. And um, in the beginning, God created man in his image. And ever since then, we've been trying to return the favor, haven't we? Uh, it's recently in Australia, closer to my own homeland, Marty Sampson, um, one of Hillsong's most prolific songwriters, um, it's become this trendy thing now. We saw it with Josh Harris, you know, to use social media to do my, basically, my apostasy, announce my apostasy on Instagram or Facebook or whatever. So Marty Sampson from Hillsong, he did that. He decided, I'm not a believer anymore. Um, because just he was just basically saying that, that his experience did not square with what Hillsong taught him about God. And a lot of people in, at uh, Grace Church were asking me what I thought about it, and I said, well, Marty is right about the God of Hillsong, and he's wrong about the God of the Bible. All right? This is the responsibility that you have, Gabe, and you, you know that, and we have, is that if you, if you preach a God who is not the real God of the Bible, they are going to find out in the real world, that that doesn't square with reality. And we preach false versions of God. The prosperity version of God is a great example where, he, where there is no suffering, where there is no difficulty. And then when people face that, they go, well, where is He? We are doing them a disservice. But that is just the great reminder of the importance of presenting and knowing God in all His attributes as He presents Himself in His Word. The true believer, the true worshipper, seeks God's face, not His hand. Right, we saw those people when they wanted a meal, they were seeking His hand. What can you give me? We seek His face. In fact, Jesus in His high priestly prayer, He equated salvation or eternal life with knowing God. Right? In John 17, 3, He prayed for His disciples and He said, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. As eternal life to know him. And that's exactly what we see with Moses. In the middle of all these problems, and whew, there are problems. You know, we're, we're, we're seeing a lot of problems engulfing us right now. It seems like insanity, the world is on fire. For Moses' world was on fire. I mean, they're in big trouble. Good chance God is just about to obliterate everyone in his wrath right now. And Moses. And he speaks to God. He, he doesn't actually say, God, please, can you, can you fix this? <laughs> can you make this better? He actually wanted God to show him his glory. Exodus 33, 18. If you look there, he says, please show me your glory. And God's wrath was burning hot. And he was set on their utter destruction. And Moses had to intercede on behalf of Israel. And note in chapter 32, verses 11 to 14. Let's look there. Just for a moment, Exodus 32, chapter, verses 11 to 14. Note that Moses interceded not on behalf of we're in trouble, he interceded on the basis of God's great name. Um, when then Moses entreated the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your anger burn against your people whom you have brought out from the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak saying with evil intent, he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth. Turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens. And all this land of which I've spoken, I will give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people appealed to God's covenant promise. Now, of course, that's just, we call that anthropomorphism, it's hard to say, um, which is God just speaking somehow on our terms. But God, of course, is not changing his mind. He doesn't, he's not confused about anything. Is merely actually, he is, it is consistent with his unchangeableness because he has promised that, you know, God, when people repent, God turns away and he forgives us and we're the beneficiaries of that it's not that God changed his mind about us his wrath was aimed at us we repented we believed and now it's turned away it's just God being consistent with his nature that he is a forgiving God and he is merciful to the repentant so we see God here being consistent with his nature Moses appeals to God's promise you've promised 
you know? And there's a promise that in, in Abraham's seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. That's yet to be fulfilled. So God knows this, and he's undoubtedly pleased that Moses is interceding in this way. So here we have Moses interceding, and God not pouring out his wrath, God withholding his wrath on because of that. God was about, and Moses, since Moses had asked God to reveal his glory, God was about to reveal himself to Moses as described in our text today. A declaration, a definition, a demonstration of who he is. These are words that would be quoted or referred to dozens of times in the Old Testament by people like King David and the prophets Joel and Jonah. And God responds to Moses' request to be shown his glory in Exodus 33, 19 to 23, where he says that, uh, let's just take a quick look at that as well, Exodus 33, verses 19 to 23. I, I, I'm really trying to set the table here for our text. And God said, and he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you and I'll be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. Hence why we don't make images of God. Then the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me and you shall stand there on the rock and it will come about while my glory is passing by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So Moses is going to get a glimpse of the edges of God's glory. God informed him of the impossibility of ever surviving a full frontal encounter with God's glory. God's holiness is dangerous. The people were told to stay back from the mountain. It's not like God's just so mad at them. Get away, get away. It's just like... I'm so holy, you're so sinful. It is dangerous to come near me. It is like that today. That's one of the great arguments against these supposed laughing revivals. Every encounter people have with the living God in the Bible, they think they're going to die. They're not laughing. And God mercifully hid Moses in the cleft of the rock and concealed much of his glory. In the first four verses of Exodus 34, we see God calling Moses to prepare for a second giving of the Ten Commandments. He smashed them. I once asked my daughter as I tried to evangelize my oldest daughter, you know, um, we were talking about sin, and I said, can you give me an example of someone breaking the Ten Commandments? And she said, yes, when Moses came down from the mountain, he got really angry when he saw him around the calf, and he smashed all the commandments. So he broke them all. And I thought... <laughs> Out of the mouth of babes, right? But he asks Moses to come here and get prepared to make a second version of the Ten Commandments. And God says, I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets which you shattered. Yet later in the chapter, we read that it was Moses who wrote the commandments. So who wrote it? God or Moses? Let me ask you, who wrote Romans? Paul or God? This is... This is the Word of God. This is what Peter was referring to when he talked about men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. We have God as a divine author and human instruments being used. And God certainly did speak as we come to our text beginning in verses 5 and the first part of verse 6. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed. So the first thing we learn is that God declares who he is. God speaks on his own behalf who he is and what he is like. God reveals here that he is a speaking God. Moses wanted to see him, didn't he? Moses wanted to see him, but God spoke to him. We're not given any record of what Moses saw. We have the record of what he heard. This is the opposite of Aaron's golden calf, isn't it? Aaron made something you could see, but was mute, didn't speak. And that's the foolishness of idolatry. These people who make these idols to worship and then pick them up and carry them to a new location. That is why this church is committed to the exposition of the inerrant Word of God. And I'm so thankful for that because God has spoken. He is a speaking God 
and what we know is what he has told us. The time will come in glory when we will see him, but for now, he has revealed to us what he is like. That's also why the heavenly tourism books are so shameful, isn't it? Not only are they fabrications, they implicitly deny our dependence on what God has already told us. God is not, a, God is not compelled to tell us everything there is to know. He has revealed to us what He has deemed sufficient for us to know. And they're reminded in the book of Job, 35 chapters of questions, God shows up at the end, doesn't answer any of the questions. He says, this is what I'm like. He is under no obligation to um, answer all our questions or meet all our demands. He has revealed what He has deemed sufficient for us to know. God spoke and Moses listened. Moses didn't start with, to me, God is like. God spoke and Moses listened. God has chosen to speak to us in His Word. I think you're all listening. It's also the written Word that reveals the living Word, as we see from the beginning of John's Gospel, isn't it? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus Christ is the culmination of everything God wants to communicate with us goes on in verse 18 there to talk about Jesus Christ, that He has explained the Father. So rather than pursuing our own mountaintop experience with God, we should recognize that God has spoken to us in His Son. We have a tremendous advantage over Moses, actually, don't we? Because we have the, fulf the fulfillment of what was promised in the Old Testament and, and the, the, the record of the life and death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We, have the, we are reminded in Hebrews, you know, God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the world, and He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature. So God left us a book. He didn't leave us a series on Netflix. He left us a book, Right? The Word of God. And it is that Word that declares who He is. I've seen this bumper sticker in America. I find it kind of interesting. In America, you know the bumper sticker? God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Who's seen that bumper sticker? Yeah, it's around, right? It's not accurate though. It should just say, God said it and that settles it whether you believe it or not. Right? God has spoken. God is a speaking God, and the first point is that God declares who He is. We don't get to do that. We don't get to do that. Second point, first point, God declares who He is. Second point, God defines who He is. Second part of verse 6. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Right? God is defining what He is like. And note here, these are attributes that Moses needed to hear about. God did not decide, even though it's true, there are many other attributes. He didn't talk to Moses about His omniscience, His omnipresence, His omnipotence, which He had pretty ably demonstrated bringing them out of Egypt anyway, hadn't He? But what does He say about Himself? The first thing He says to Moses a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That's what Israel needed to hear about because they're in big trouble. They're in, they're in such rebellion against the God who made them and He has every right to snuff them out in His wrath. But it's interesting also to think about that we like the what-ifs. And I'm sure many of you had that what-if, you know, when we read the fall account. What would the world be like today if Adam hadn't fallen? And maybe we've even thought that this week. Oh, if only Adam hadn't fallen, all this stuff wouldn't have happened. All this terrible stuff would have happened, right? Why did he have to do that? <laughs> Couldn't he have just done what he was told? But think about this. What if the central character in the Bible is not us, but God? And his ultimate purpose is to glorify himself. And we are the beneficiaries of that because He glorifies Himself by redeeming a people and bringing them to Himself. But 
He is the central character and is ultimately about His glory. And what if God, a big part of God glorifying Himself, is showing who He is? He desires to make Himself known, to make us know what He is like. And here's a huge thought. In a world without sin, how could we ever know about God's mercy and His grace that He is slow to anger and a forgiving God? Could we know those things about God in a world without sin? Could we? No. Isn't that a huge thought? That though God is not responsible for sin, He is not the author of sin, sin in some way is some divine necessity in order for God to make Himself fully known. And He deems that so critically important that sin is the backdrop for Him to make that known. He'll walk outside in a moment. And if it's not Washington State, and it's not California, but there might be some blue sky, but you won't see any stars until tonight. So what happens? Do the stars just go away during the day? They pack up, take a rest? Or is it just that in the light of the sun, you can't see their, their glory? And it is actually the backdrop of our sin and Adam's fall, the darkness of sin that makes the glory of God's mercy and forgiveness shine most brightly. Just like you see the stars at night against the dark night sky, so to the glory of God's mercy and forgiveness shines, shines most brightly, against, contrasted against the backdrop of our sin. And, you know, Jesus said to that woman, you know, when... when uh, when the Pharisee asked him, why is this woman wiping your feet with her hair and her tears? And Jesus said, who rejoices the most? He who is forgiven of much or he who is forgiven of little? One of the greatest gifts of God is a deeper revelation of our own sin because it helps us to appreciate Him more and be thankful for Him more. So the attributes God chose to define to Moses directly applied to the situation Israel were in. They needed a God who was like this. Let's look at these words at the second part of verse 6. God says, the Lord, the Lord. So God pronounces His name, repeating it for emphasis. The Lord, or Yahweh, is more than just a title. It represents His entire being and nature. He is the God of creation who covenanted with Moses <coughs> at the burning bush, saying He is who He is, and this is who He is. So he's naming Himself. First um, attribute we see, merciful. After the gross idolatry of Israel, this is a comforting reminder that God is compassionate and sympathetic. The more we grasp our sin, the more it magnifies the mercy of God. Also, God is gracious. In my 30 years as a Christian, I have observed that there are far more churchgoers who talk about grace than those who actually know what it means. It fundamentally means undeserved favor. It's amazing how many people can talk about grace without ever talking about sin. Because it's unmerited favor. And if grace is God's unmerited favor, then we'd better know why we don't merit it. That's an obligation to teach that. Don't ever go to a church where they don't, uh, don't love you enough to tell you that hard truth. You need to know why we don't merit it. And grace is God's unmerited favor. Mercy and grace. And fundamentally, the difference between mercy and grace is this. Put simply, and I'll repeat this because this is worth etching in our minds, mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. And grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. God's riches at Christ's expense, right? So mercy is God withholding what we do deserve. And grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. That is what God is like. That is, that is so much of the goodness of the gospel in that, that God does that in spite of our sin. He's also slow to anger. That's good news. <laughs> Moses need to hear that. Because <laughs> that would make him furious. People who marvel, you know, there's this caricature, there's this idea out there, you know, there's two gods. There's the God of the Old Testament, and He's the angry, wrathful God who punishes people. And the God of the New Testament is all sunshine and lollipops and love. 
But any honest reading of the Old Testament will tell you that the, the amazing thing about the Old Testament is how long God took to pour out His wrath. How does He put up with these people? That's what I found myself thinking. How, is he put, how does He put up with me? How's He putting up with these people? I was talking to an atheist. How can God be just to wipe out a people group? And I walked him through. I said, well, let's look at Sodom and Gomorrah. And I talked him through and I explained the story, you know, and Abraham pleads with the angels before they go and negotiates down 50, 40, 30, 10, 5. In this big city, is there five righteous people? Will you spare it? And it wasn't because it was destroyed. So we know there wasn't even that many. And then as I told the story of Lot, and Lot dithers, doesn't he? They're saying, you've got to get out of town. Lot dithers, you know. And this is a wicked place, right? This is off the chart wicked. They're so wicked that even when they're struck with blindness, they're still consumed with their lust. You see people when they lose their sight in the battlefield, it's immediate panic. I can't see, I can't see. When, when the lights go out, it normally causes a person to just launch into extreme panic because it's very distressing. But that didn't distress the people of Sodom. They were struck with blindness, they still just madly reach for the door. So consumed with us. This is a bad place. And the angels are telling him, we're going to destroy this place, you need to get out. And Moses, uh, sorry, Lot lingers inside him. And as I talked to this atheist about it, as I kept dragging out the story, he eventually just exploded and said, why doesn't he just wipe out Lot too? And I said, aha, now you're asking the right question, right? Because that's the question of the Old Testament. Why did God even rescue Lot? Because and according to your value system, even Lot wasn't worth rescuing out of there. And that's the mercy of God. The marvel of the Old Testament is that God delays His wrath. Israel stayed in slavery for 400 years because the sins of the Canaanites was not full. Right? God delayed the judgment of the flood for 120 years while Moses preached and built. He was a preacher, a preacher of righteousness. No one gets on. 120 years he waits. The marvel of the Old Testament is that God is so slow in pouring out His judgment. If you read it honestly, He is slow to anger. And the fact that we are alive and well and sitting here today hearing this message is testament that God is slow to anger. And I lived in Denmark. I worked in a factory. They have a lot of unions there. I don't know if you have many unions. I don't think you have unions so much in America, but they have a lot of unions. And the union representative was a flaming Marxist. He would wear his Mao Tse Tung shirts and his Stalin shirts into work. Yes, he would. <laughs> and I would say to him, what have you been doing? He said, I've been fighting for justice. And I would say, no, you're not. And he gets so mad. <laughs> I was just winding him up. That's what we do. That's our gifting as Australians, to just really <laughs> wind people up, really wind them up. He'd say, yes. I'm fighting for just... No, you're not. And he just gets so mad. I said, eventually, I said, you don't need justice. If you, if God, if you get justice right now, you're a scorch mark on the ground. You need mercy. And I explained the gospel to him. And I don't know if he repented, but he never hassled me anymore about joining the union. <laughs> Which is uh, maybe a suggestion for when telemarketers call you on the phone as well. But... <laughs> But God is slow to anger. We would do well to meditate on that a long time before we consider making demands for certain things. So uh, he is merciful, he is gracious, he is slow to anger. He is also love and faithfulness. Our merci merciful, gracious, long-suffering God abounds in love and faithfulness. The Hebrew words here are often translated as loving kindness and truth. God's covenant love for His people here is connected with His unwavering commitment to that love. Once He promises to love, He keeps on loving. Not because we're lovable, but because He is committed to that love. And you know, that's why even when people talk about self-esteem, I say, we, need, we don't need self-esteem, we need to esteem Christ. And He loved, you know, our value was so great that He died for us. Now, here's the thing, is that he was willing to pay such a huge price to pay for us. That's where my value is. In the massive price, my Savior was willing to pay to purchase my pardon. 
This pairing of love and faithfulness, grace and truth, is, is, is another way of it's sometimes translated, make a common pair in the Old Testament. Now, it seemed that the Apostle John had that Hebrew pair in mind when he opened his gospel describing Jesus as full of grace and truth. So God defines himself. He has declared who he is. He has defined who he is. And that self-definition became substantive in the person of Christ. God on the mountain is also God in the manger. Right? It's interesting that Moses would one day encounter the fulfillment of this in the person of Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration. But God declares who he is. God defines who he is. And my third point, God demonstrates who he is. God demonstrates who he is. Let's look at verse 7. Keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generations. So God demonstrates who he is. Firstly, God demonstrates steadfast love. As I touched on before, why did God set his love on Israel? Because he chose to love them. We love him because he first loved us. You know, sometimes, um, you know, people might say um, to me, you know, um, all this use of the law to bring the knowledge of sin, you know, you talking about the law of God because sometimes we you know we talk about sin in order to in order to show what we are forgiven of we say look that's just legalism just stop being so legalistic Cameron all you need to do is love God and love people I say how you doing at that oh pretty good actually like don't you realize what you just said is the fulfillment of the whole law you're the legalist. You're saying it. And you know what? It's not easy. We think, we talk about just love God and love people. That's not easy to do. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And really, I mean, it's hard. The hard work of Christianity is loving people. Because we've got to deal with all our mess. You know, we need to get downwind of ourselves sometimes, don't we? I live next door to a pig farm quite a while in Denmark <laughs> we always knew which way the wind was blowing <laughs> we always knew but we need to get downwind of ourselves and have an honest assessment of ourselves all right and Christ, and Christ is the embodiment of God's steadfast love for us because of our sin right and God is committed to that love he is committed to that steadfast love it is a relentless love an unwavering love it's extraordinary because our love wanes right that's what i'm trying to say our love wanes we can love the people but we get tired we get fatigued we get love fatigue in our flesh i know i do so that's the hard work is loving but god is steadfast in his love and christ the embodiment of that he said that all that the father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me i will never cast out he is faithful to that. Christ's life, death, and resurrection is the ultimate demonstration of his steadfast love. God so loved. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So you can't talk about God's love without talking about sin either, can you? Because the very definition of God's love is bound up in the fact that we are sinners. In this is love. Not that we have loved God but that he also loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Steadfast love of God. God demonstrates also forgiveness. The Hebrew verb here means to lift or carry away. A picture of what God does with the sins of his people. Lifting the burden and carrying it away. Remembering it no more. It's not that God's forgetful. He just chooses not to remember. He chooses not to hold that against us. That is good news. That's unbelievably good news. And again, like I said earlier, if we have a, a, a sane understanding of our sin, that's even greater news. He wipes that. He doesn't hold that against us. 
Christ embodied that forgiveness. He demonstrated that. We see in the gospel accounts that the Pharisees, what were the Pharisees more amazed about? You get, you've seen there's some incidents where Jesus heals someone and forgives their sin. What shocked the Pharisees the most? His forgiveness. We're not so amazed by the forgiveness of God. Yeah, can't you just forgive him? You know? They were shocked. And you know, as wrong as the Pharisees were about most things, they were right to be shocked by that. That was the thing that astounded them, that Christ forgave sins, because it's hard to forgive sins. Luther got this. That was why Luther, that was his struggle as a, as a Catholic monk, was how can God forgive the sins when there are so many? He had this heightened awareness of the holiness of God and our sinfulness. And they were staggered by it. And yet, he is a forgiving God. Jesus is described in Hebrews as a compassionate high priest. Not one who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, and yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So, he is a forgiving and compassionate God. And he has been through what we've been through. And I think that is the answer, because... You know, um, as a Christian, you know, it, to come to saving faith, it's p important, first of all, that we don't see ourselves primarily as the victim, but the perpetrator. Right? Because Christ died in the place of sinners, right? Now, there are victims. There are people who endure injustices and terrible things in this world. And I haven't been through things that other people have gone through. But what we have is a compassionate high priest who has. And we can say to them that he suffered more injustice than anyone has ever suffered. He did. And, and, and not only that, he has, he has been through that, that, that he knows what it's like. Even though I might, he knows what it's like. You can go to him and, and, and the worst in the cross... Think about this. The worst thing that ever happened was also the best thing that ever happened. So even though we can't make sense of these wrong things that happened, we know that God used the worst, most unjust, most wicked, vile thing that ever happened to be the greatest thing that happened. That is the heart of the good news. He's forgiving. What does He forgive? It says here, He forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. Three words... Basically, put simply, encompassing all the realm of sin. Doing what you shouldn't do, not doing what you should do, and every form of immorality in between. Right? It's just everything. It's all encompassing. So, so God has declared who He is, right? He's defined who He is. He demonstrates who He is. We don't do that, do we? We don't get to do that. And that's why we don't even get to live the gospel. I hate that phrase, live the gospel, because it's a message about someone who did things that I can't do. Right? So God keeps steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And this would be a great point to end this message. If we want to go out on a warm fuzzy, I can just end right here. Right? He, he forgives. Good news. In the ESV, it's a but. In the NASB that I'm reading, it's a yet. We're looking in verse... Um, I've, got, I've got ESV just written here, but yeah, verse uh, 7. Yet. We've got to go on. If I'm going to preach the whole counsel of God, I've got to go on here. I've got to press... Through. Yet He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. This is the not warm and fuzzy part of the passage. So, just quickly on that last bit, it should be noted that when God says visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and then the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations, that is not saying that we will be judged for the sins of our parents and parents that we will be judged for the sins of our children. That's merely saying that sin has consequences. And we see that, and I've seen it and experienced it and seen it in others, that there's generational consequences of sin in our lives, isn't there? 
um, reckless financial decisions, immorality and things like that, there are long-term consequences of it. But the main thing I want you to focus on here is the yet. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. So we have learnt all this about God. All these attributes that he is merciful, that he is forgiving, that he is loving, that he is gracious, and he wants to demonstrate these things and make these things known. But here's the problem, and here's the real mystery of the whole Bible. How does God remain just while demonstrating his mercy? So how is God merciful to us, but not violating his justice? Because he's committed to it. That's why it says, yet he, he will by no means clear the guilty. He can't just, it isn't just a sorry and we turn the other way, which is what I thought in my early Christian experience, where I just thought, well, we say he was sorry and God looks the other way or something, or just says it's okay. No, there is, justice has to be met. All right? And this is one of the problems, we talked about this at Gabe's last night, about the C.S. Lewis movement, the movie The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, is that they have to pay the ransom to the witch, who is representative of Satan. No, God's justice must be satisfied, not Satan's justice. God is committed to his justice. And how does God remain just? Because if God is unjust, if God just lets a sinner go free, he is unjust. He ungods himself. He violates his nature. He cannot do that. He can't. We have imperfect judges in this world, but the Lord of the universe, the sovereign of the universe, cannot compromise one inch on his perfect justice. So how does God remain just while demonstrating mercy? If anyone asks how a loving God can send people to hell, he's asking the wrong question. We need to help them ask the right question. First half of evangelism. And the right question is to ask, how can a just God justify wicked people? That was Luther's question. He was the only one, they all thought he was crazy, but he was the only one asking the right question. How can God pardon a sinner without being corrupt and violating his justice? But the second half of evangelism is answering that right question. And that is that God demonstrates all of those attributes that we have just seen in the person and work of Christ. In the person and work of Christ. Turn with me to Romans 3, 21, 26. Romans 3, 21 to 26. This is how God remains just while forgiving sinners. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift... By his grace, through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God, the long suffering, the slow to angerness of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. There it is. So how is God both just and the justifier of the sinner? Through the person and work of Christ. I, I, I think the height of the MacArthur Study Bible, I call it the Everest of the MacArthur Study Bible, is his commentary on Romans uh, sorry, First Second Corinthians five twenty one, which is you know he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that in him we might be the righteousness of Christ. And 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 MacArthur says of that God treated Christ as if he lived our life, so that he could treat us as if we lived his life. And there is the justice of God. God's justice is satisfied in the substitute. So when you see the cross, that represents the one who was the substitute. And we need to know why we should have hung there if we are to recognize him as the substitute. 
So Christ fulfilled the law that we have broken. His life was not without meaning. Of course, we know that, but significant meaning in that for those 33 years, he was fulfilling all righteousness. He was fulfilling the law that I have broken. There is now a man. A man has done that. And when he went to the cross, he suffered the punishment I deserve. So when the accuser comes, say, look at Cameron, and he did those bad things. Yes, but my justice has been satisfied in his substitute. And the other thing is, and this is a great argument against Jehovah's Witnesses who believe that it was Michael, the archangel, who died on the cross. I say, well, what does that do to God's justice? If God sends Michael to die on the cross, he's no longer just, is he? He's just punished someone else in your place. But if the judge himself gets down from the judgment seat and comes and fulfills the law that we have broken as a man, identifying among us, and then suffering and dying and take the punishment in our place, God's justice is vindicated and His mercy and grace is gloriously demonstrated, manifested and granted. And that is what we see in the person of Christ. We see what Moses had revealed to him on the mountain is fulfilled, that God demonstrates the way that he is able to both demonstrate these glorious attributes of himself and maintain his justice. Because God's justice must be satisfied, that leaves only two kinds of people in this world. Those who repent and trust in Christ have had God's wrath exhausted against them on their substitute. Those who are unrepentant will face God's wrath for all eternity. So there are sinners who will endure God's wrath for all eternity, and there are sinners who have had God's wrath exhausted in the substitute. Which kind are you? Verse 8. Verse 8 of Exodus 34. Moses didn't worship God on his terms. What do we see here? After God's revelation of himself, of who he is, what does Moses do in verse 8? Moses quickly bowed his head towards the earth and worshipped. Once God declared, defined and demonstrated who he is to Moses, Moses humbled himself and worshipped God on his terms. And that is the only option for us as true Christians. Nadab and Abihu, example of that. We don't come up with our own recipes, our own terms. That's why we stick to God's Word, because He has told us who He is and how He is to be worshipped. Moses worshipped God on His terms, and we should too. God made us, He owns us, He sustains us, He He graciously withholds His just wrath against us, giving us time to repent and place our faith in the One who perfected God's law and satisfied His just wrath. How dare we refuse God the worship that He rightly demands? How dare we? Let's bow now, as Moses did, and give thanks. Lord, we thank You. We thank You that You are not like a God that we would devise, because we could never devise a God as great as You. We have such an overblown sense of of how good we are, that we could never understand what our real needs are. But you do. And we thank you that you have told us, you have revealed yourself to us in your word. We thank you that you will one day see you in your glory, but that you have revealed yourself to sinners like us in your word and shown and and, and declared what you are like and demonstrated what you are like, ultimately in the person of Christ. Help us to worship you the way you are so infinitely worthy to be worshipped. You are glorious, you are great. We thank you for your revelation of yourself and ask you to help us to worship you, to honour you, to glorify you in our lives in a way that is pleasing to you, that we would worship you on your terms.